here today again and especially in this very special feast of the Holy Spirit so I'm going to begin by reflecting upon the gift of the Holy Spirit and I'm going to ask the Lord for his words and I'm going to read to you from Romans 8 5 life through the Spirit those walking according to the flesh tend towards what is flesh those led by the Spirit to what is Spirit. Flesh tends towards, towards death, while the Spirit aims at life and peace. What the flesh seeks is against God. It does not agree. It cannot even submit to the law of God. So, those walking according to the flesh cannot please God. Yet, your existence is not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Because the Spirit of God is within you. If you did not have the Spirit of Christ, you will not belong to Him. But Christ is within you. Though the body is branded by death as a consequence of sin, the Spirit is life and holiness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is within you, He who raised Jesus Christ from among the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Yes, He will do it through His Spirit who dwells within you. Then, brothers, let us leave the flesh and no longer live according to it. If not, we will die. Rather, walking in the Spirit, let us put, let us put to death the body's deeds so that we may live. All those who walk in the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. Then, no more fear. You did not receive a spirit of slavery, but the spirit that makes you sons and daughters. And every time we cry, Abba, this is Dad, Father. The spirit assures our spirit that we are sons and daughters of God. If we are children, we are heirs too. Ours will be the inheritance of God, and we will share it with Christ. For if we now suffer with Him, we will also share glory with Him. The Word of the Lord. So it is for us a, an amazing joy to understand what the Holy Spirit is about. And the Holy Spirit is a gift. It's a magnificent gift. And we know about the promises and how Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit all along his public life and he was introducing it and obviously wasn't understood at all because to uh, introduce is to announce and it's like the prophets of old they were all announcing Jesus introducing Jesus but people had no clue as to what it was going to really be like to be with the Messiah the, the fact is that they, they didn't even accept him as the Messiah because they had such different ideas and now Jesus introduced to the apostles the Holy Spirit. They never got it until they got it, until they received it. Because the idea of introducing was a, a pedagogy, a way of teaching and preparing the heart for a mystery that is, uh, that is unexplainable. You, could, you couldn't possibly uh, get it unless you receive it. It's like, it's like motherhood. Only a mother knows what it is to be a mother, you know. No one else knows. It's something that is in your womb, and, and you have to experience that in order to understand motherhood. And so, this, the Holy Spirit is an experience. And though we have received the Spirit, still, many times, 
we could probably say that we haven't experienced the Spirit in our life, though we have it in us. And the reason is very simple. How many times have we uh, received all of our lives the love of a mother, of a father, and we haven't experienced it in our heart until they die? So it happens. Some people do not appreciate the love of parents or the love of family or friends until they die. And then when they die, they figure, wow, I'm, I'm missing this person. This person was important in my life. This person feel a big space in my heart and now it's gone. So, and it's the time to appreciate it when it's gone. So that's, that happens to a lot of people when they die and they realize they never experienced the Holy Spirit, though the Holy Spirit was always in, was always with us. And then it's a, it's a very sad moment. Same thing happens when you are standing by a casket of someone's death and then knowing that you could have done much better with that person that is gone, you know, and, and then there's nothing you can do. It's over. Same thing happens when you die and you, you, you transcend, you go into the uh, fullness of the spiritual life and then you realize how much time, how many graces you wasted because you were not experiencing the greatest gift of your life which was the Holy Spirit, and it's too late, you can't come back, so this is over. And so this is life, you know, life is about experiencing what we are to experience now, not later, you know. And so the Lord is providing to us, for us today, the experience of the Holy Spirit. It's not an intellectual experience, though it will affect the intellect eventually because it will permeate everything, but it's not an intellectual experience. It's an, a spiritual experience, which goes directly to your heart, and it will transform your life. And it was, it's, not, it's not an event that you have to do anything special in order to experience it. It's, it's just an opening of the heart to acknowledge what you have been given. That's what the Holy Spirit is about. The Holy Spirit is about acknowledging. It's like if you reflect upon your relationship with your loved ones, and you're sitting at home and they still are around you, you have an opportunity to really see their love and feel it that maybe you haven't for a long time or for your whole life, you haven't even thought about how big is the love of your mother or your father or your husband, your wife or your children or your friends. And, and you begin to acknowledge that and you begin to feel safe and loved and uh, you feel uh, that you have a company. You have an affection that is important in your life and is complementary to your daily life and struggles and survival. And, and then you feel, you feel this incredible love that you didn't appreciate before. And this is just a human realm, which is very simple and very basic and limited. And imagine if you allow that to happen in your life with the Holy Spirit. And then you begin to understand that God did really give you a big gift and that the big gift is alive and moving in your life. It's just that you haven't paid attention to it, but it is there, it's moving. But it's so gentle, you know, it's so gentle and so perfect. Like I was explaining yesterday of the actions and the role of the guardian angel that is so tender, so perfectly loving that you hardly obey it. It's too, too perfect, you know, it's like a child when a child smiles and, and leads you to do something. Say, it's a child, it's so small, sometimes you don't even go for what the child is saying, right? And the child is leading you to do something, to hug him, to take him somewhere, to, I don't know what, to smile sometimes, only to smile. And sometimes you don't obey that, because it's too perfect, it's too beautiful, it's too small, it's too little, and sometimes you don't really go to that level of littleness and, uh, and tenderness and softness and loving and purity, innocence. And we, 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 we tend to detach ourselves from these very important um, gifts of life, like the smile of a child, you know? How many times a child smiles to us and we don't smile back? And we think the child doesn't know. The child feels sad, of course, because he, he smiles at you. What is he expecting? You smile back. I, I can see a lot of adults that are so stiff and so hard and so darkened already. They don't smile back to a child. And the child goes like this, smile like this. Yeah. And sometimes the adult goes like, yeah. you know, and it's like it hurts. It hurts even to see it. Imagine the child is going to be hurt too. You know, it's like, it's, they usually go like, 
they frown and they say, whoa, who's this, you know? So that's why sometimes we look at children and they cry when we look at them. <laughs> we scare them. <laughs> but one thing is important to realize about the gift of the Spirit, and it is that we, you know, Jesus, uh, the great and divine master, always presented his teachings with very simple examples and the examples he gives are very plain human examples so that we can relate to it he never came he never came with this sophisticated theology where we have to really concentrate for hours and study a hundred books in order to get it you know never did that divine master is about simplicity it's about something very humble and simple and basic and the choice of words is like the most plain change, choice of words, anyone will understand it, a child, an elderly, whoever, you know, it doesn't matter, you will understand it. It's God speaking, therefore it's very simple, you know. That's why if we, if we want to compare the experience in the Holy Spirit in our lives, we just go to the simple fact of how do we experience love among us, you know. How do I experience my mother's love even if your mother is gone or really like mine, you know, but still, I remember now when I converted, my mother was dead already, and, and uh, I remember I never really loved my mother, you know, she loved me uh, till, till she died, and, and she, that love transcended, obviously, because love is eternal, but my love was human. My love was in real for my mother. You know, it's, I thought I loved my mother, but when I had the experience with God, I realized I never did. Because true love is something very different. You know, true love is being faithful, is being obedient, is being humble, is not being, is not challenging and questioning anyone. It's just, going, it's just, it's, it's just, it's a union. It's a, it's a unit, it's a communion. That's what love is about. And what I did with my love, my wife, my uh, <coughs> mother all, all my life was challenge her religion you know um, and also go against a lot of the things she wanted me to do and so if I really look back I said I never love her because if I would have loved her I would have obeyed her and then I didn't so I didn't honor my mother the way my the commandments asked me to obey you know and therefore big sin and, and you have to ask for forgiveness because that's, it is a big sin and it's a sin against love so, this is a way for us to find out the Spirit, how we are experiencing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is experienced like that. Because it's the Holy Spirit in us who leads us to love perfectly. Who leads, leads us to love well, to do good loving, you know, to, to be good with love. And, and that is only the Holy Spirit action. So, how will we find out how much of the Holy Spirit do we have in us? It's how much are we loving? How much are we forgiving? How much patience and tolerance do we have? How much, how much confidence do we have in God and trust in God? And how much do we really care for one another? How much do I care for the salvation of all of humanity? See, that is the Holy Spirit. The amount of the Holy Spirit in your life is that love that grows for everyone. Because, you know, if you have an experience of love in your life where... The only people that you care for, for real, are your immediate loved ones on the immediate bloodline and also the ones that benefit you immediately around you, that benefit your survival or whatever it is, you know, that, that support your psychology, you know, whatever it is. That is not the Spirit of God. That has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. Like the, like the Word of God says, even evil people do that. Even evil people care for their loved ones, for the ones immediately beside them. So it's not a big deal, nothing to do with God's love. So that's why sometimes when I'm standing in a corner somewhere in the city and people are flowing by, I beg the Lord, I say, Lord, please give me the love for these people. I don't want them to pass by like the cattle. I don't want them to be just flowing cattle. I want them to be human beings and children of God and people I care for. I should care for them. Maybe i never seen them. I will never see them again, but they are mine. God gave them to me. That's why they pass by. That's why I saw them. That's why they pass me by, because God gave them to me. They belong to me. They belong to my heart. I should love them. I should have a space for them. I should not ignore them. I should not let them pass like the cattle, like a bird that flew by. 
No, they have to be in my heart. And this is the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit in us is that love that grows and expands everywhere. That you love everyone. And you know, we have a lot of talk about love in this, in, in this culture of ours. Love is a word that is so used in, in the wrong directions. You know, you, you remember the 60s. I am, a, I am an, um, a product of the 60s, so to say. And then love was very common was a word that was in everybody's lips and, and it was not the love I'm talking about the wrong love you know and and this love I'm talking about is the perfect love the love of God the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is that love that takes us and leads us to open up and understand that we are part of a whole human family and that human family is part of one body whose head is Jesus and then this whole mystical body is God in us and we belong to this kingdom of light and love and therefore in order to be a cell, an active cell a living cell of these organisms of the mystical body of God we need to be part of it by loving it, you know, by existing in it within love. And that love is the Holy Spirit, and we have to ask for it. You know, it's like if you stand here, where I am standing looking at all of you, you see individuals, and each one is so unique. And then I have, I have to ask myself, what am I doing here in front of all of you? See, did I come here to make a big deal out of myself and just to show you who I am and what God has done in my life and all the things and the gifts and things that I could present to you? Did I come here to do that? And then, or did I come here because I love you, because I care for your salvation, because you are important to me, because every one of you is, uh, is, is to be with me in the glory of God at the end of this life? And then, this is, what is it that I'm doing? It's very important to really locate yourself where you belong. You know, it's like uh, I could come here and I could be so aware of myself and so aware of all of you that I'm never going to be able to be objective and to focus on the love of God that is to be served through me. Because then I'm too much of myself and very little of God and God is not going to be able to use me, right? Because I am in the way, I'm an obstacle. And usually so many times we are dealing among each, among each other, we are dealing with each other and then we become an obstacle of that relationship because we are too aware of ourselves, too aware of the person we're dealing with and it's, it's such, a, such a gigantic human presence and awareness that we don't let the spirit flow. The Holy Spirit is not able to flow through us and we have these obstacles. Then we walk away a little concerned. She was kind of strange today. She wasn't, uh, and then we have all these doubts, you know, and then we go back home and we cannot even sleep well because we feel like something went wrong in that meeting, right? And it's just that we didn't love well. That's what happened. It's not that we weren't loved, it's that we didn't love well because we wouldn't be worried, you know, it's like well, if you are concerned, it's because you didn't love perfectly. You, you didn't do what you had to do. You were too much of yourself. So you blocked the love of God. And you know, when we block the love of God, we even get sick. There a lot of mental disease, a lot of physical disease, a lot of distress and anxieties and depressions come from not loving well. That's from holding back. From, from holding back on your, own, on your own and being afraid of making a mistake, being afraid of things going wrong, being afraid of, of I don't know, the future or guilty of the past and so many other things that are nonsensical because they, are, they don't belong to our existence. We import them. We, we adopt them. You know, we bring them in. No need. You know, and we do. But all of that is simply because we are not allowing the Spirit of God to flow through us freely. That's the only reason. Because you see, the Holy Spirit is literally oxygen. You know, when someone is really sick and they take that person to the hospital, the first thing they do, they plug that person to oxygen, right? And they oxygenate the blood. Because that's the first thing you have to heal oxygenate the blood so the blood can circulate with more oxygen and go to the areas that are hurt and bring more life to it so this is what happens with the Holy Spirit in our lives uh, the Holy Spirit is oxygen for the soul so the soul is saddened is hurt is confused is darkened by by our daily walk you know our daily endeavors and struggles we 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 
we walk and walk and then things happen. So the Holy Spirit, if, if it circulates through us, if we breathe it, and if we are constantly within the Holy Spirit, it's constantly renewing us because it's like an oxygen that is flowing through our soul and renewing us and, and, and letting go of all these blockages that, that come along just by existing. You know, you wake up in the morning and you could be loaded with feelings, with many things that could actually really disturb your whole day, you know? And you don't know where that comes from. It's just in you. And it's just uh, things that flow through us and we accumulate so much. We are like, uh, we, are, we, we, we absorb many things, you know? And, and, and we don't know sometimes how to select them and distribute them in order for them not to poison us or not to, uh, not to be um, completely turn into an obstacle. You know, I, I give you an example. When we do not have a good administration of the culture we live in, we live in a culture today that's really fast, and it's a, a culture that has so much information and it's so accessible. And, and sometimes we don't pay attention to all the things that we pick up and all the things that we, we assimilate and the things we buy, you know, that we take in without selection. We just take it in, like the news. You can be watching the news for an hour and you don't really care and pay attention of the type of things that you are picking up. And then you go to bed after that. And many times you don't even pray before you go to bed after you turn that TV on, off. And then when you wake up in the morning the next day, you are feeling weary and things are wrong in your heart and you have all these incredible situation going on about how depressed you are and negative about life and you have uh, all kinds of preconceived notions about things that are not real and why it's because you picked up a lot of stuff you shouldn't before you went to bed the, na the night before and then you woke up with all this load you know and sometimes someone calls us on the phone and he speaks to us for 30 minutes before we go to bed and they just drop all kinds of stuff on you and then you don't even pray after you hang up and then you don't you don't exercise yourself, you know, from things that don't belong to you. It's good to listen to your, to your neighbor, it's good to help people, it's good to be charitable. But at the same time, clean up, you know, clean up afterwards. It's like nurses, you know, nurses, what they do? They work with the patients and what do they do when they, before they leave? They wash their hands, they, they use all kinds of stuff, they, they are very careful and walk away, you know. And we don't do that, spiritually we need to do that. If someone calls you and they have so much going on in their lives and they are under lots of pressure and they let, let you, you know, share that and then you are a company and you listen, then after that you have to remember you couldn't keep that for yourself because that is going to produce the same effect it produced on the person that called you, right? So you, what you do is you have to pray and let go of all of that, clean up and then go to bed. That way the next day you're not going to wake up loaded with stuff that is not yours. And then you're not going to remember where you got it from. And imagine some people accumulate months of that, years of that. And then at the end they end up with all kinds of problems, you know, because they don't even know where they come from. They end up laying down on a sofa with a string with a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist, is the only thing he's going to do is he's going to answer back with your own words, you know. And then if he can't handle it, he's going to dump you, right? <laughs> That's all they do. They, they lay down and say, okay, let it out. And then you speak for an hour and then he comes back and answers a few things with your own choice of words. And then if it doesn't work, take this pill, right? <laughs> and see me next week. So one day we have to stop all of this and we have to understand that there is something larger given to us, much larger, which is the Holy Spirit. And today we are witnessing that not by history, by a spirit. You know, we are witnessing that because today is the day that the church chose to present to us this mystery in a, in a liturgical way. And you know, the liturgy is divine. And we have to remember that. The liturgy is not made up by human beings. It's not a plain human religion. It's divine, has a, has a divine origin. Because the liturgy is put together by the mysteries of Jesus' incarnation, but by the mystery of Jesus' passion, uh, dead on the cross, resurrection, ascension to heaven, and all of these incredible uh, sacred histories all, of, all, all within the liturgy. And the liturgy is 
literally the city of light, the holy city of Jerusalem. It, it, that's what it is, the liturgy. So therefore, if we understand the day of today of the Holy Spirit through the liturgy, we will know that it is a fact that today we have a special gift given to us. We have already that gift within us. But what the liturgy does is revives and renews the gifts constantly by the liturgy itself. It's like uh, we go to Mass all the time. And we go through the seasons, the liturgical seasons. We go to, through Advent and then Lent. And then we go to Ordinary Time. And we go through all of that. And then we hear the same readings. And we have these three years, this cycle of, of readings of the, of the liturgy. And, and we, we, all of those words are familiar to us. But you see something very important here about the Holy Spirit. You could, you could hear the reading of a passage of the scripture all of your life. And every time you hear it, it's going to ring in a different way in your heart. Every time. Because the word is eternal. It's just, it's always new. Though they are the same words, they, they ring different in your heart. Example, we wake up in the morning to the same sunshine and the same moon at night. And it, don't we call it a new day? And we have the same elements? Same elements. Some people even wake up in the same house and go to bed in the same house forever, for years. So I visit people sometimes that tell me I have been here for 65 years in this house, you know? 65 going, going to bed at the same place and waking up in the same place. So, but I tell you, if you ask that person for those 65 years, they're going to tell you they always had a new day, right? They had a new day in the same place, going to bed in the same place, waking up on the same bed, and then, but they had a new day during the whole 65 years. So this is, what me, this is what the Holy Spirit is about. The Holy Spirit makes everything new, though it is in the same place, you know, because it is the heart that appears to be feeling the same all the time and appears to have the same flaws and at the same time the same way of enjoying when, when joy is, is present. But, but everything is made anew when we understand the action of the Spirit. Because then we realize that there is a miracle behind this. Otherwise we would have gone insane a long time ago. Because we wouldn't understand how could we be stuck here within the same elements that don't change. And we are here, stuck. It would have been terrible. But if because of the action of the Spirit, the Spirit makes everything new, though you are in the same spot all the time. And it's new. Even prisoners in a cell, prisoners in a cell, end up having a new day confined to a little cell. And they wake up every day, they have a new day, though they are in the same place. Otherwise, they would have gone insane, all of them, right? So it's the, it's the action of God that is so mysterious. It's so mysterious. But if, we, if you become more aware of the action of the Holy Spirit, your life enriches in a way that you will be amazed how much freedom you will get, how much peace, how much joy. Because then the more you embrace the magnificence of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the, the more freedom and also the more joy, the more peace, the more humbleness. And then you, you will be like a, like a beaming light for everybody because they can see God, they can see the Holy Spirit in you. And also the Holy Spirit flows through you. Since you, you don't ever have to really make much of anything, you, you will flow with it. You just be on time. You are punctual in everything. You are punctual in your thoughts. You are punctual in your feelings. You are punctual in your emotions. You are punctual in everything that you are participating in during your daily flow of life, of living, of existing. You are punctual. You are on time. You are there. The beat of your heart goes along with nature and God and humanity and everyone. It's, 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 uh, it's extraordinary. Extraordinary. Because you become a true living organism within the spirit of God. So you will be flesh and spirit in harmony. Which is the ultimate. It's the ultimate. It's the calling. You see, the Holy Spirit appears among us because He was like the ultimate touch of the bridge that I was talking about yesterday, the bridge between flesh and spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is, is that ultimate touch. Jesus came and built it with us, brick by brick, you know, put it together, 
And then he said, I'm going to send you the paraclete because he's the one that is going to be walking back and forth with you to, for, over this bridge all your life, you know. So he's going to come and he's going to be with you. And this is who he is, you know. He's, he comes here to lead us and to take us everywhere and then to tell us what to do everywhere all the time and to give us what we need. And this is something that is within us, you know. It's like uh, sometimes we are alone, we feel lonely. Right? And we feel depressed and, and there, are, there, there is emptiness in us. And, and most of the time that we're going through this, if we really think about it deeply, we're going to find out that it's a consequence of sin most of the time. A great part of the time is a consequence of sin. A lot of the times, as one of the most common sins that leads you to that is the sin of slot. Right? Another one that is very common to that, the sins of the flesh, you know, the impurity, uh, all of that, envy. There are many greed. They make you really depressed and empty, and they, they, it brings a, a lot of sadness and depression in your life. And it's all because of the absence of the Holy Spirit. See, all of those are areas of emptiness of the Holy Spirit. You, if you concentrate on that and, and declare war, to your vices, declare war to your weaknesses, and then declare serious war against it, then the Holy Spirit becomes stronger in you. Because then, when you declare war to your weaknesses and your abyss, you know, your darkness, you, uh, when you declare war to sin, to vice, then the Holy Spirit becomes stronger, obviously. It's like when you have, as a child, a relationship with your father, that is a little difficult because of your lack of uh, discipline, right? And then daddy is always uh, watching you, you know? And then it's not, it's not being very patient with your mistakes because you are too much about mistakes, too little about obedience. And then you become a little weary in the relationship. But if you begin to show that you are really declaring a war against your, your disobedience and your lack of attention and all the things that make you a flaw, you know, with your father, then that is going to build a little more confidence and his love is going to get closer. And I feel that something is working because he is supporting me now. He's not judging me. He's not watching me. He's supporting me because he sees I am doing the job. I'm just declaring war to what is wrong in my life. That the Holy Spirit comes. Holy Spirit is uh, is our Father, Daddy. You know, it comes in because it's God Himself. It's is an is the third person of the Holy Trinity, but it's God Himself. It's Abba also. It's Father. It's also Jesus, it's, all, it's, it's the Trinity, but the Spirit moves in a very particular way, in a very particular way. And the, and the way that it moves is that we, when we show that we want it, that, that, that we, we need it, that we understand it, that this is the truth in our life, I want to engage in a relationship with the Spirit of God, I, I understand it, I need it, I know how it works. That is the moment of the Holy Spirit. He pours upon you and He comes in and fills you. And you feel that peace. You feel that joy. You feel that understanding that, that, that God is moving within your life. And, and He moves because you see the results immediately, completely. You know, you go to Mass and, and when you come, before you go to Mass, you know there is a big battle before you go to Mass. A spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare. Because you see the spirits of evil do not want you to go to Mass. The biggest nightmare of hell are Eucharistic instruments of reparation. That's who we are. So th we are the biggest nightmare of hell. Because every time we take communion and we are in grace with God, we are stopping miles and miles of evil work and also saving souls. Because the Lord is able to buy souls with our blood. See, if I am in grace with God and I take communion, my blood becomes Christ-like at the moment of communion and is able to buy salvation of souls right there every time I take communion. Imagine, you think the, the devil is going to let that just go by like that? There's a big battle. Before you go to Mass, he tries to drive you, you know, to, to get you into this spirit of indifference where, where you're going to go, but you are going to go like in a routinary fashion. You know, you don't have your heart in it and you push yourself to it. And sometimes you go and take communion not being prepared to take communion. And many times you don't even go to the Mass that you wanted to go. You didn't make it. 
because the devil won, right? And every time you don't make it to mass, someone won. You see, someone lost. And then who lost? A soul that could have been saved. And the biggest sadness of a Catholic when dying is to find all the wasted Eucharist. I believe, believe me, that that's going to be the, the, the longest crying of a soul will be all the time you could have gone to take communion and you didn't. And then you can see where you were and the exchange. What did you do and it's instead of going to communion? And you're going to see. And, and that is painful. It's very painful. Because it's like parents, when the children are gone, they're grown up and gone. And then they sit at home in the living room. They begin to reflect all the times they weren't there for the children. And all the things they could have done that could have been better. And all the things. And then they're rocking on the chair, go back and forth. And then you see, it's like, and, and there's nothing you can do about that because that is like a purgatory. See, you cannot change the reality. But it is in you. Because now that everything is over, now you know how to do it right, right? <laughs> Hindsight has 2020, right? Like they say. But w one thing is that now we're talking spiritually and, and we are being prepared by God so that we, we don't have to be sitting on a rocking chair in purgatory going, oh, I should have, I shouldn't, you know, knitting there, I don't know what, you know, spider web. But the thing is, we're going to have to be careful because God wants us to be alert and awake now, not tomorrow. We have to do it today. You have to be understanding what the action of the Holy Spirit in your life is, the gifts that have been passed along to you, the responsibilities you have with them, and also where the Spirit is. The Spirit is a presence that is undeniable. You know, It's like uh, you, if before you go to Mass, let's say we're going to have Mass in a little bit. And your heart knows, your soul knows, the devil too, right? So this is a big thing going on. You Deep inside you, we all know we are going to Mass in a little bit. So it's in us. It's a mystical presence. And it's already being prepared. See, the Mass that is going to take place here is being prepared as we speak. Angels are fighting. There is a lot of thing going on right now about the Mass that is going to take place here. A lot. And then inside all of us, there is also something going on in relationship with this mass. It's, it's, so it is mystical, it's invisible to us, but it's taking place. And if you really tap into this kind of a spirituality, you will be aware of all these battles and you're going to be, become much better. You know, Because then you're going to be more attentive, more alert, and you're going to be more spiritual about the experience of the, of the liturgy. <coughs> The liturgy, which is life, is divinity. So th then we, if, if God calls us to understand the action of the Holy Spirit, the action of the Holy Spirit will be to be mystical about the Mass. You know, to understand that this is an experience larger than we could ever conceive. Much larger. And, and that is within us. You know, it's all within us. And it exists in us. We are part of the liturgy. We, we are a cell of the mystery that is going to take place. And therefore, as a body, the whole body is moving towards this mystery now. And, and we, are, we are going to experience it and it, well, being part of it. It's a, so it's like when they have the preparation for a big moment in the family, you know, an anniversary, parents' anniversary, uh, who, who knows, something important in the family. And then for a week they're talking about it and they're preparing and they, there are some arguments going on. Someone wants it green, the other one wants it blue, and then flowers and things and all kinds of stuff is going on for a week, you know, and it's, it's this big celebration taking place at home because something important is going to happen and you have to celebrate it right and things have to be in place and people have to be invited and all of that and then uh, there are conflicts in the family someone is not talking to another and then two others are trying to get them together to speak so they can show up at the, at the, at the place and, and this is the Mass this is exactly what the Mass is about but it happens in the spiritual realm the spirits are trying to put everything together and saying, we're going to have to get this one to communion because this one is a key today for salvation of these areas and all of that. And they're trying to push all of this. And then the devil is coming. I know who they're trying to bring in. Hey, come on, let's stop this, you know. And all of this war is going on. And it, it looks like, it sounds like a movie, but it is beyond a movie. 
Movies are made out of those things, you know? Mo movies are human imagination. Where do you think they come from? They come from the spiritual realm. All of our creativity, all of our imagination comes from the spiritual realm. So when you see a movie, when you see action on Earth, it has a spiritual origin. See, we are just clay. We couldn't come up with that. This is, we, we just ground. So all of these ideas come from the air. They come from the spirit. They, they, are, they don't come from the clay, from, the, from, from this mud, you know. It comes from the spirit. Everything comes from the spirit. So that's why the Holy Spirit is the key for us because we're going to have the main force, the main ground, the, the main power with us. And then every spirit and every, everything that has to do with the spiritual realm is under control because we are with the spirit, the spirit of God. And then everything is under control. That's why the only way we can assure, be sure, that we are walking with the Spirit of God is when we are actually feeling that love and not feeling it only for us not only for our personal peace but because we're loving people you know when I came into the faith and I was already 48 because when I was kidnapped by the rebels I was 47 I was set free when I was 48 already and I came into the faith and I was so surprised when I begin to feel love for people I despised all my life, you know? Like, like strangers in the street. I never cared for people I didn't know. Never did. Once in a while, someone was attractive, especially women, right? And then strange women in the street. I didn't mind that, right? I was very, very interested about it. But, but I, I never pay attention to strangers unless I had something to gain, right? But, but just, I didn't have any love for strangers. No love. Even, I didn't even have love for relatives, unless they were important to me for some reason. You know, I didn't have true love for them. Didn't care, never called them. Didn't, they weren't in my mind, in my heart, in my memory, nothing. They were gone, disappeared. And, and so was with friends and everyone. So when I came back already with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit in me active, not that I didn't have it before, but I w it was inactive, you know. So now that it was, you know, active in my life, I begin to feel these things that were totally abnormal to me. Say, how come I'm, I'm, I'm feeling for this person here? Like, I was, I was like just feeling love for this person. And I felt really strange, you know, like really, it wasn't normal to me at all, you know. So sometimes I, my friends and my colleagues in California, they used to tell me, my old colleagues, you know, they say, you're going to land back one day. Uh, you're terribly uh, impacted by the whole experience and you're traumatized. You should get help, you know. And I will go, and I will say, Sometimes when I was feeling love for people I never loved before, I was thinking maybe I need help. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I, it was so abnormal. <laughs> I say, how could I be loving these people? This is not, this is not good. <laughs> See, and, and then I, because I, I thought, just, I'm becoming too soft. <laughs> this is too dangerous. I'm becoming way too humble. So, then they're going to walk all over me. You see, this is the end of my life. There's no hope. And so it took a while. It took a while to really cross that bridge and accept this simplicity and humbleness and love and compassion and tolerance and patience. I found myself listening to people for a long time that I would have shocked before. You know, it's like, people, you know people that come with a monologue and it's always the same story, and they come and, and t talk to you for an hour, and the same story, you know, it's like, and then, but I was sitting there listening to this, as if it was the first time. I said, this is not normal, you know? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> and, but, you know, at the end, when I, when I really got into this and became a unity with this miracle, then I was in so much joy because I understood. And it happened one time because I was in a bus in some kind of little pilgrimage in Los Angeles. One of my first baby steps within the church.
church as a religion and, and as all this mystery of pilgrimage, I, I did, had no clue of any of that, right? I end up in a bus like that because one day to one of the churches I used to go to Mass in Los Angeles, there were all these ladies from the Legion of Mary and they grabbed me like this, right? <laughs> and I went, they say, you have to come with us. You know, our lady wants you to come with us. And they were all women, all ladies. You know, I say, well, this is for women only. They say, oh no, we always take on board some of, some of the guys that our lady chooses and that she chose you like that. Just like this, you know, I'm going, uh, I couldn't say no for some reason, right? Because I was already being that soft, you know? So <laughs> they grabbed me. So I end up with them the next day. That was a Saturday. And they took me to a place outside Los Angeles where there was some kind of manifestation of Our Lady. I wasn't very much into understanding this kind of stuff. So I went up there with that. They pray a hundred rosaries in the bus, you know? I was completely burnt out and well, I wasn't used to, to so much religion, right? So I was just walking in like, though I had this great mystical experience, I didn't have a religious experience, you know? And they, so they were totally religious and they had medals everywhere and things. <laughs> it was incredible, right? Stamps everywhere, the bus was just everywhere there were things. And so we end up there and then we sit in on, on a little rock with this lady that is like the leader of the pack there. And she's telling me, do you know anything about the Holy Spirit? And I, so I look around and say, uh, I heard about it. <laughs> and she said, because those times I didn't speak about my mystical experience. I spent two years in silence. So this lady had no clue that I went through that mystical experience. So she's asking me that and she said, watch me. He said, I'm going to talk to this woman that we brought with us. She's very sad. She's broken down. She's a very sad case. And then watch the Holy Spirit at work. And then <laughs> she went to this girl that was sitting right beside and began to pray with her. Pray with her and talk to her. So this girl broke down and cried and screamed. And I was going, wow, this is strange, you know. And then, then all of this happened. So when everything was over and then they began the last rosary before we went back to Los Angeles, right? That was the longest one of all. <laughs> and I'm there and, they, and I'm very exhausted on the second mystery because there were long reflections on every mystery. So we were we're talking about, not exaggeration, we're talking about like 20 minutes on the second mystery, right? That's, I mean, 20 minutes already and two mysteries, right? That's like a long time. And, and then she says, the rest of this mystery, we're going to do them on our knees, right? Right there with rocks on the ground and all of that. I say, oh, this is, this is the big leagues, you know? So no, I say, no wonder they call them legion. The legion of... <laughs> I, I walk back. I walk back very slowly away from the crowd, right? Walk back and kind of hit sort of halfway behind a bush and a rock, and there I stay standing. I, I didn't kneel. I say, I don't know, I'm gonna kneel for 40 more minutes here, I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then what happened is that when the rosary was over, this girl was in the very back of everybody, the closest to me, right? The girl she, that was prayed over by this old lady. So when the rosary was over, this girl got up very slowly and turned around. She was transformed. She was another person. And that really impacted me. I was like, wow, I never seen anything like this. She was a whole different human being. Young, smiley, she was happy. She was like transformed, you know? She wasn't a, that dramatic one that I saw there bent and, and broken and destroyed and darkened. And she was a transformed. And at that moment, it hit me right in the chest. I said, the Holy Spirit, you know? I was like, whoa, it wasn't that lady. For sure she wasn't. And then I said, it was the Holy Spirit. And that was the first experience I had of the action of the Holy Spirit on people, right? Because I saw it with my own eyes. It was a reality. And I was a very rational human being. I wasn't, I was, I had a mystical experience, but I was far from being a mystical person. See, if you know what I mean, I, I was just getting into this and I was going like, yes, this is something real. You know, this happens before my eyes. It's a, it's a reality. It happens. It changes people. It, it, it transforms people and it does it instantaneously. It was, there was, I mean, there was no more time uh, passed by between the time she prayed over this woman and the time the rosary was over. Probably 
30 minutes or 40 minutes, I don't know how long the rosary took, an hour, you know. <laughs> so, but anyways, it was a miracle. And the girl, I continued seeing her in the church, and she never went back. She was always on fire, you know, after that. I'm sure she had his, her bad days once in a while, but she was a person that was changed. And I spoke to her just for curiosity, you know, I used to, used to ask her questions you know, outside the church sometimes. How are you doing? What's going on in your life? You know? But I was just curious to find out if he was stable, if it was real. Because I was acting as a psychologist there, right? So going the science. And, and sure enough, it was the Holy Spirit. And from there on, I begin to see the action of the Spirit in simple things, very basic things. Because usually we have the idea that the Holy Spirit action and presence in our life, we have to go to a charismatic group, right? And see people just fall on the ground and begin to speak in tongues and, think, and people being healed or whatever. And that's the action of the Holy Spirit. Obviously it is. But you know, it's much more than that. The Holy Spirit is at work all the time. See, every time you forgive is the Holy Spirit. Every time you feel that love for someone and care and patience and love, that is the Holy Spirit. There's no way you could do that without the Holy Spirit. Every time you have this need to pray, that is the Holy Spirit. When you all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you have this need to save a prayer. That is the fire of the Holy Spirit in you. And then if you begin to detect all of that, then, then you know where the Holy Spirit is at and what He's doing in your life. And it's precious to acknowledge that. It's like, I know, like a, a, a husband that has a good wife, and he is a good husband, he will always know what the wife is doing for him. You know, because the wife is always peculiar about doing, being so meticulous about everything she's doing for her husband, right? And then the husband is seeing all of that, and loving his wife in silence because of all these incredible gifts that she lays out for him, just out of love. Not because she wants him to say, thank you, I love you, look at all the things you do for me. On the contrary, that perfect love is silent, it's like there, it's lay out, and the husband is enjoying that love, that perfect love. And that is the perfect lover, the perfect love, and the perfect love is God, God is like that, God lays it out for us, and everything is in place, and then when we acknowledge the Holy Spirit, the love of God, then God is even loving us even more because then we know He's there. He placed it there. He did this. He did that. This is placed by the one who loves us, you know, and He's always making sure that everything is perfectly given to us in a magnificent way, in a silent way, in a perfect way, not expecting anything, nothing, without a big noise and nothing extraordinary, as simple as that. And that is the presence of the Holy Spirit because we could become very theological about this and I don't, I'm not a theologian and I wouldn't have this explanation theologically. But I could give you very simple examples and human examples as to what the Holy Spirit is in my life. And that is the way I see the Holy Spirit work. That, that is the way that I see the Holy Spirit work in my life and the life of, of everybody else and in the life of the church in the life of this whole creation and in the life of angels and saints and purgatory and hell. Because you see this, that same fire of the love of God is the one that is actually burning souls in hell because they separated themselves from the love of God and that's what burns them, that, that absence of love. And this is what happens, you know, sometimes if we want to figure out what hell is about, see, when you lose a friend because of a mistake you made, and that friendship is down, broken, and you, you, you have very little cho chances of, of, of regaining that friendship. You feel this incredible loss, you know, you feel this incredible void in you. Something died, something died, and it's an emptiness that you cannot feel. I mean, it's there, and you cannot do nothing to repair that. It's empty, it's just empty. Something belonged there, and it's not there any longer. And if you magnify that, um, that's hell. That's exactly hell. It's separation from love. It, and it's, it's really a big void that you can never do anything about it. So I, I'm sure that we could speak about the Holy Spirit forever because it's eternal. Right? It's like some people think the Holy Spirit only has seven gifts. You know? And you know number seven is an infinite number means all of the gifts. And we have to understand that. It's not only seven. Seven is an infinite number. 
It's a number is an, 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 an limitless, unlimited. And, and this is what we have to realize. The Holy Spirit is God, and, and God has all of the gifts, and therefore is unlimited what the, the Spirit can do for us. Impossible things in life, absolutely impossible, God can change. I've seen it in my life. Impossible things, like I was saying to you before, Never in my wildest dreams I ever thought I was going to love strangers. You know, people that were insignificant in my life. People that passed by my life for 47 years. I never ever for a second cared for any of them. Ever in my life. And all of a sudden, I do. So that is a miracle. You know, this, you can see it is a miracle. It doesn't happen for any other reason. And I, we could have, we can pick up a million examples like that. And it is the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask the Lord for His words. <coughs> and I'm going to read to you from Romans. Uh, this is chapter 8, 28. And it says, Who shall separate us from the love of God? We know that in everything God works for the good of those who love Him whom he has called according to his plan. Those whom he knew beforehand, he has also predestined to be like his son, similar to him, so that he may be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so, those whom God predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he makes righteous. And to those whom he makes righteous, he will give his glory. What shall we say after this? If God is with us, who shall be against us? If he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not give us all things with him? Who shall accuse those chosen by God? He takes away their guilt. Who will dare to condemn them? Christ who died and better still rose and is seated at the right hand of God interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will it be trials or anguish? persecution or hunger, <coughs> lack of clothing, or dangers or sword. As the scripture says, for your sake we are being killed all day long. They treat us like sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all this we are more than conquerors, thanks to him who has loved us. I am certain that neither death nor life, neither angels nor spiritual powers, neither the present nor the future, nor cosmic powers, were they from heaven or from the deep world below, nor any creature whatsoever, will separate us from the love of God, which we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The word of the Lord. Amen.